can also put your finger in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Second Kings chapter 6 and Luke chapter 21. All right, so Luke chapter, or sorry, King, Second Kings chapter 6, we'll begin reading verse number 15. And it says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Also, then skipping over to Luke chapter 21 and reading just one portion of scripture. Uh, verse number 28. And it says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Lord, I pray that you will be with us today, that you will let us receive what your word is for us today, and that you will anoint my mind and anoint my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. I would say God bless you, you may be seated, but most of you already are. So, for the next little while, I'd like to speak on just two words. Look up. So, in our world today, we have many things that are going on. We have political unrest, especially here in the States. Things are uh, happening that are unsure. There's earthquakes that are happening at an alarming rate. More and more each day are going on. Threatenings of food shortages and even the news articles are stating that the food shortages that are coming are of biblical proportions. You have these uh, different wars that are going on or the threatenings of wars. You have all kinds of different things that are impacting our lives and are creating an environment that is, needless to say, is uncertain and uneasy. We have the effects of the coronavirus uh, which, you know, thus being on Zoom, it's one of the effects of it, but also the fact of there's increased amount of anxiety. People are living in fear. They are unsure of what will happen next. They don't know where to go, and they're being engulfed by depression and anxiety. The uncertainty that most people face because either they've lost their jobs or they maybe are not sure what's going to happen next in a political area. Maybe that they are looking and they're seeing family members who are sick and don't know exactly how to do it and, you know, what exactly is the proper treatment and will things actually go back to anywhere close to what the normal is that they have known before. So they live with this uncertainty and they live with this question of their own existence of what's going to happen, what's going to happen to my kids, what's going to happen to my family members. How is this going to play out? Am I going to have enough money at the end of the month? They have all these increasing fears. And while we had a lot of these fears before, especially over the last year, these fears have been amplified within people. And some people have resulted in questioning the existence of God or existence of God, the hand of God in any situation. However, as we know, when everything looks darkest and there is no hope that it seems to be left. We just have to look up. See, a few months ago, we began, uh, we did a series on the end times where we focused and uh, looked at the end times through the lens of Matthew 24 and Revelation, Revelation chapter seven, 5 through 7. Since we our discussion, uh, tensions have risen throughout the world. I just named a few of them earlier. But specifically, the tensions between China and the U.S. have escalated. The tensions with Iran have escalated, both of which there are 
uh, top officials predicting war, either with Iran or with China. There are top uh, political officials and military officials who are predicting that as early as six months to a year from now, obviously that's their prediction, no guarantee of it, that a geopolitical incident on the magnitude of World War I or World War II will happen between the U.S. and China. If you recall back to our discussion of that, that would be the red horse, in my personal opinion. Additionally, global elites and governmental leaders are freely discussing the topic of what they're calling the Great Reset. This is where they take the current monetary systems and basically make them worthless and transfer the entire wealth and prosperity of um, what once was the US Canadian dollar, the pound, the euro, the Chinese yen, all these different currencies and switch to a different way of looking at it, a different way of using it, which would then usher in a heightened state of inflation and all kinds of um, food shortages because people would not be able to pay for it. And they're saying that this is coming and that this is an opportunity for them to reset how everything is going to look in the world and how everything is seen in the world. We know that biblically a financial reset would be seen through the eyes of the black horse in the book of Revelation. So all this stuff that we see going on, the joblessness at all time high numbers, there is a prediction of about 30 to 40 million people in the U.S. alone who are without work since the beginning of 2020. People are committing suicides at a higher rate than ever before. D domestic violence is on a, is skyrocketing. Civil unrest, the protests, the uh, attacks, the uh, the burning, everything else that's going on. Potential armed conflicts are armed conflicts that are going on. Lots of people who may be getting sick for various reasons, whether their immune system is down, whether they're getting sick from the virus or whatever it may be. There's a lot of things that are going on. There's a lot of things that we can see in our world. And as we, as Christians, look forward to the coming of Christ, we can see that some of these things are actually being predicted in the Bible, and it can be terrifying. That's why a lot of people these days are looking around in fear, even if they're not a believer. They're looking at and saying, what in the world am I going to do? Where am I going to go? They're talking about that we're, we're going to be switching to a digital currency within a year. They're talking about that we're going to go cashless into a cashless society. How am, I, how am I going to fare? Am I going to be able to keep my house? Am I going to be able to keep all the possessions that I have? And how is everything going to pan out? In many ways, we are like that servant of Elisha. Because when we walked out of our door in January of 2020, all of a sudden, things started coming around. And we started looking around us and started seeing what in the world's going on. It doesn't matter which way we turn, whether it's the virus, whether it's wars, whether it's political, whatever it may be, everywhere we look, there's always something else. There's all there's a host that is encamping around about the uh, the population and even uh, specifically around the church population that is making it so that we look like we are about to be taken out, that we're about to be brought under the control and the rule of something that we don't want. And you see the uh, different things that are happening, even you know, you look at what the Canadian government is doing with the various laws and stuff that are being passed with them. And it's not, there is not a lot of hope that could be said as far as the world is concerned when looking around. How additionally, with the churches being closed, the anti religious sediment is at an all time high. And just as I said, governments are enacting measures around the world not seen since Germany of World War II. And you can look at it and say, what in the world's going on? How are we ever going to come out of this? But just like Elisha said to his servant, 
He prayed that God would open his eyes because even though we may be looking at situations that are beyond our control, we can't control what the government does. We cannot control a lot of what's going on around us. We cannot control what's happening in the situations that we find ourselves in. We may be locked into a a uh, deadly clash with our adversary, spiritually uh, speaking, and we may not know what to do. But the thing is, is we have to see that there is a greater purpose, that there is a greater thing, that there is more that is with us than they are with them. There is more that is protecting us than what's going on. Yeah, things can be scary, but the thing is, is God is not the author of fear. According to 2 Timothy chapter 1, Beginning at verse number seven, it says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Paul is writing to Timothy, his son in the gospel, and he is saying, Don't be, don't let fear be consumed about what might happen to me. Don't worry about the fact that I'm in jail in Rome right now, and it doesn't look like I'm getting out. Don't be concerned with that. Don't focus on the fear because God is, that's not what God is about because the Bible also says that perfect love casteth out all fear. So God has not given us that spirit of fear, but he has given us power through the Holy Ghost and of love for our mankind, and we love everyone. We don't have to walk around and look at each other and say, oh, I, I don't care for that person. I don't care for this person based upon the things that the world says, but we can overcome what we are facing through the love of God and of a sound mind. That means we're thinking straight. We're not being taken advantage of by the things that are around us, we are looking and we are focusing on everything that we are supposed to be doing. And he said that that, that he's told Timothy to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And as I stated in our discussion of the end times, there is no biblical precedence that's saying that we're going to escape persecution or tribulation. But we can approach it looking at it through a different light than what most of the people in the world look at it. See, right now, they're looking at it through their eyes of fear. They're looking at it through eyes of terror. They're looking through eyes of uncertainty. But we can look at it through God's coming back. Because as it said in the book of Luke, chapter 21, it says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Don't focus on what's happening. He said, look up because your redemption draws nigh. So it means that God is coming soon. It means that we can take solace in the fact it doesn't matter what happens here on earth because man can only touch our physical bodies. But if we know that ultimately we will be with him for all of eternity, that is our hope. First Thessalonians chapter four, where it talks about the rapture. And it says that God's going to come back and that we will be captured away to be with him. First Thessalonians chapter four and verse 18 says, comfort one another with these words. We are to comfort ourselves with the fact that in the impact and in the absence of earthly hope, we have an eternal hope. So, yes, there may be a situation where it becomes outlaws to be Christians, but we know that it doesn't matter what actually ultimately happens because we will be in heaven but we cannot be comforted or avoid the feeling of fear if we are looking at the problems. It wasn't until Elisha's servant looked up at the army that was surrounding the horses and chariots of fire that were 
there to protect them, that he was able to get above his fear and get above his hysteria and get above the situations that we find ourselves in. So that's why it is so important. And Luke chapter 21 is another chapter that discusses end time situations. It talks about the different things that will happen. And that's why it says at the beginning of these things. Because our only source of hope, our only source of peace is in Jesus Christ. And the only way we're going to see him and the only way we're going to see it happen is if we look up. It's not about what we have to endure during this time. It's not about whether or not Things go perfectly for us because the Bible says it rains on the just and on the unjust. But where we are going in regards to the situations that we find ourselves is not going to be too different to the book of Acts. It's not going to be too different to the dark ages. The the persecution that it has, the, apostle, the apostles in Acts... The book of Acts, thank God for being counted worthy to suffer for his name. So it's not about what happens to us and whether or not we come out of this unscathed before we pass on to our eternal reward. But it's about the fact that our focus has to be upward. Our focus has to be on the fact that regardless, it doesn't matter what happens here. It's about what's coming and it's about where it's going to go. There was this old story about an elderly lady who uh, attended a church for many, many years. And she fell ill. This was a long time ago. The doctors tried to get her well. They tried everything that they could. They couldn't figure it out. Finally, news came to her saying, it's terminal. You're not, you're not going to make it. The, we, we found that you have cancer and the cancer has just, it's, it's gone too far. There, there's no hope of surviving this attack. So as she was preparing everything and getting ready, her pastor came over to visit. And as they talked, they just, she began to discuss how she wants everything to be done the situations, your funeral, the the eulogy, the proceedings, who would speak. She went over everything. They sat there for a while and prayed together. And then as the pastor turned to go, she called them back and said, Oh, but pastor, before you close the casket, I was wondering if you could put a Bible in my left hand. I want to be buried with my Bible. The pastor nodded, understanding this request and realizing that, you know, it's our grasp of hope and our grasp of the future. He said, of course I will, and started to leave. But she called him back one more time. And she said, Pastor, along with the Bible in my left hand, I would like you to place a fork in my right hand. The pastor sat silent for a minute. He's like, you know, I've done a lot of funerals, and there's been many strange requests, but I've never had a request like this. Why, may I ask, do you want a fork to be placed in her hand, in your hand? She looked up at him with almost a far-off glaze. She said, because... I think back over my life and to all the times when either I had meals with family members or at the church and everything else, they would, everyone would bring food and everyone to fellowship together and would eat and get everything, everything would be so nice. But it didn't matter what, what everyone had to eat. It didn't matter if it was good or was it not good? It didn't matter if it was roast or chicken or ham or whatever it may be. 
when they would come around to start cleaning up the main part of the meal, they would always say, hold on to your fork. Because it didn't matter what had been going on so far. The fact is, there was always the dessert coming. And the dessert to me was always better and always more desirable than the main meal. So for me, I want there to be a fork in my right hand because I know that something better is coming. There's always something better on the way. There's always something that I can look forward to. So I got my Bible and I know that even though this life was good, that even though this, everything I've had, all my experiences and all the situations that I've had in my life are fantastic, and my family is amazing, and my uh, friends are amazing, and everything around me is always so good, I can look forward to the fact that something better is coming. Just like that story, we need to have that viewpoint and that mindset. That if we are right with God, if we are where we are supposed to be, then even if we have to prepare things in this earthly time frame that may not be pleasant, like funerals, or we have to go visit people who are sick, we can know that ultimately there is something better coming. There is something better that's on our way, and we can keep looking up towards what is coming. So as we face this times, we can know two things for sure. One, that we need to be ready for the trumpet to sound. That is the number one thing that we need to be ready for. And two, that we are focused on him and what he can do and where we're going instead of on the situations and the circumstances that surround us. The road ahead is not going to be easy, but if we know our death final destination, then we can walk through it with confidence, knowing that he will be there, knowing that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us, regardless of what situation is going on. We can hang on to that fork, knowing that the next thing to come, regardless of the pain in our current life, is going to reach and be what we ultimately want it to be. We can focus on the good and not the bad. So tonight I'm here to encourage you that regardless of the situation that you find yourself in, regardless of the situation that the world finds yourself in or what might happen tomorrow, God knows what is happening. He knows and is, in, as, and is in control. And we can trust his plan because he sets things up and he takes it down. So regardless of what happens, we know that ultimately God's plan is being done. As we close out tonight, i just like us to take a moment and pray. Be, and say, God, it doesn't matter what's happening. I want to trust you. I want to be thinking along the lines of Elisha and not his servant, where I look at the opportunities and I look at the potential and I look at the positive things of what's coming and what can be versus the negativity that surrounds me. For the next few minutes, let's spend some time in prayer.